Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Hiro Yoshikawa, the academic dean here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and welcome um, to uh, 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 this one in a series of the Asquith Forums here, uh, which are a series of public lectures that uh, bring leaders in the field of education to share their knowledge, um, their, their practice and policy uh, experience. And uh, it's a delight for me to introduce Norman Atkins, um, uh, who heads up the Relay School of Education, um, to our School of Education. Um, and uh, the context um, for this talk uh, and for our bringing him here uh, is our desire to kind of be involved in uh, discussions ranging across the entire breadth of the education sector. And one of the most challenging problems uh, is how to uh, train the next generation of teachers uh, in uh, America's schools. And this is an instance of an innovative organization, um, uh, and we have um, uh, started to explore the idea of um, uh, engaging in a dialogue uh, with uh, Relay and um, other instances of innovation uh, in uh, the area of uh, training teachers. Um, so uh, Norm uh, got his uh, degrees from Brown University and Columbia Teachers College, um, and uh, in 1989 became uh, the co-executive director of the Robin Hood Foundation, which, uh, as many of you know, uh, really kind of broke op open the field of philanthropy with its uh, innovations um, in how it approached uh, grant making and metrics uh, and accountability for the field of philanthropy, specifically in the area of fighting poverty. Um, he's since been involved in uh, founding several charter school organizations, including the North Star Academy Charter School uh, in Newark, um, the Network of Uncommon Schools, uh, which now has about 32 schools serving over 8,000 students. And uh, in um, uh, 2008, uh, together with Dave Levin of KIPP, um, and uh, Deisha Toll of Achievement First, he co-founded um, Teacher U, uh, which um, uh, became the basis ultimately for the Relay Graduate School of Education. Um, and I've heard uh, uh, bits and pieces of that, um, uh, what's been going on there from one of my advisees who happens to be one of the adjunct uh, professors in that program since when it was uh, Teacher U. So um, it's been, uh, a organization perceived at really the cutting edge of where um, education might go in terms of teacher training at scale to improve public schooling. So we're fortunate um, to have uh, Norm here, and please join me in welcoming him. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Hero. Um, I saw, um, is Marion Wright Edelman, she came or she's coming? Like, wow, that's uh, such an honor. She is my Shiro. Um, it's such an honor to um, be connected to her. Say that again? Move closer to the microphone. Um, so um, it's really cool to be here. And I want to use this occasion, if you'll permit me, um, to talk to um, some former students of mine who are asking about what they can do and should do in education reform, and a couple of um, assistants that I've had who are working, um, one to help start Students for Education Reform and the other is leading Students for Education Reform in New Jersey, and um, really trying to think about um, how to address them, and perhaps some of you in particular, about what the next um, phase of education reform might look like. And this is very much in draft uh, format, so um, I hope you'll, you'll help me. Um, so about uh, six weeks ago, I came across a New York Times piece in the actual newspaper, not on my mobile device, that caught my attention. It was by a journalist named David Gonzalez. The planned closing of Blessed Sacrament School in the Bronx, a haven amid the housing projects in the Soundview neighborhood, has left many parents and graduates upset. That includes the valedictorian of the class of 1968, who grew up in the projects that now bear her name. 
I am heartbroken, this illustrious alum said. You know how important those eight years were? It's symbolic of what it means for all of our families, like my mother, who were dirt poor. She watched what happened to my cousins in public school and worried if we went there, we might not get out. So she scrimped and saved. It was a road of opportunity for kids with no alternative. Indeed, a glance at some of New York City's most successful and influential Latino and black professionals and politicians is like a Catholic school all-star alumni roster. The Roman Catholic schools that have been shuttered in impoverished neighborhoods in recent years have produced enough lawyers to staff a white shoe firm and enough doctors for a top tier research hospital. And those schools could make the difference between becoming a judge or appearing before one. This is still the New York Times article. The incidence of high school dropouts for kids from Catholic grammar schools is dramatically lower the famous alum said. The number of kids who go on to higher education is statistically higher. There are wonderful public schools in the city, but our kids don't often live near them or they haven't been adequately prepared for entrance to these schools. The Roman Catholic Archdiocese of New York announced this week that it would close 24 schools, including seven elementary schools in the Bronx, because of financial pressures. The famous alum, her recollection of Blessed Sacrament is unsentimental and unvarnished, reflecting the complicated feelings shared by many of the era's graduates, the writer continues. She remembers how third grade left her in constant dread of running afoul of the black-robed Sisters of Charity who taught classes bursting with up to 50 students. Discipline, she wrote, was virtually an eighth sacrament. On Friday, the famous alumna recalled one episode from her years at the school. When she told the nun she did not want to eat a piece of rye bread, the nun invoked a familiar response. There are starving kids in India, the nun said. Well, said the famous alum when she was a girl, I'll mail it to them. She was hauled up to the front of the cafeteria and slapped. Everyone saw me get punished for the smart mouth that I had, she said. That was a message that doesn't always get taught when you are struggling to survive. That there are other people more needy than you and that you have an obligation to think about them. Looking back, Blessed Sacrament taught her an unshakable lesson. It taught me how to be a good person, she said. In the kind of world we lived in, with drug addiction and crime and sadness that permeates the community, you needed a model of someone teaching you that being a good human being has value. Her father died when she was in the fourth grade and her mother had to raise her and her brother alone. Blessed Sacrament gave her mother a two for one deal. Her mother worked hard even as it drew disapproval from the nuns who frowned on women working outside the home. Their disapproval was felt by latchkey kids, she wrote. The irony, of course, was that my mother wouldn't have been working such long hours if not to pay the educate for the education she believed was the key to aspirations for a better life. The girl's ambitions, odd as they seem, are to become an attorney and someday marry, Sister Regina wrote in the girl's yearbook. Hopefully, she wishes to be successful in both fields. We predict a new life of challenges in Cardinal Spellman, it's a high school, where she will be attending, and we hope she will be able to meet these new challenges. Who am I talking about? Sonia Sotomayor. And what... Um, what, what, do we, what do we gather from that story? What are, some, what are some things that you hear and reflect upon when you hear that little squib in the New York Times just from six weeks ago? Uh huh. Great. What else? You wanted me to repeat the, sen the sense of community that she felt? Yeah. yeah, she said sense of community that she felt. What else? Yes? 
Class size is 50. Class size doesn't matter there. Yes, what else? Yes, we have corporal punishment, right? And she's walking around uh, afraid in the third grade. What else? Uh, the role of parental expectations in the, her mother's work to set those for her side. Yep, very good. What else? Yeah, fascinating. What she remembers, role of character education, what she remembers is not anything that she is learning in a classroom. What she is remembering is something that happened in a cafeteria, and it's a very almost violent episode, but she remembers it as something that instilled in her the character to be a good person. Anything else? So I think, you, I think you've hit some of the first things that occurred to me. Um, and we could spend a lot of time unpacking the meaning of this uh, within public education. Um, it is striking uh, how the basic core understanding of people living in low-income communities, particularly at that time, is that public school education is not working for them and that it is a uh, disastrous outcome to end up in those other schools. Um, but in particular, I want to today um, focus us on three points. Um, first, um, as old schools are closing, as we're closing down particularly old district public schools in low-income communities, let us reflect on and be clear that these particular buildings and schools are considered very precious community treasures and resources, and that we should not blithely shutter these buildings and think that everything is OK. Two, let's honor what Catholic education did to raise up generations of immigrants, of low-income children in the United States. Um, the time that uh, Justice Sotomayor was at um, Blessed Sacrament School, there were about five to five and a half a million children in parochial schools in the United States. There were 13,000 parochial schools across the country. Today, it is 40% that number, 40% that number, uh, um, and about half the number of schools. Um, and this despite the fact that the Catholic population is 45% higher and that tuition for these schools is probably about a fifth of what it is in most uh, of the per people spending in public schools, particularly in elementary schools. Um, there is an era that's passing, and I am thinking particularly about um, the Christian Brothers, which is an order of the church that focuses on teaching, not on being uh, the, uh, the clergy in a pulpit. So Christian Brothers, anybody know, founded by Jean-Baptiste de La Salle um, in the late 1600s, a brilliant individual committed to social justice and social entrepreneurship. He noticed that rich people would get tutors and that education was essentially something that was passed on by wealthy people from one generation to the next in the form of one uh, teacher to one student at a time. And he got the idea that it would be much better to teach low-income students as a whole group and essentially created the DNA of what we see in our schools today, essentially what um, Tayak and Cuban call the grammar of schooling, essentially a teacher with a group of, in Justice Sotomayor's case, 50 students, but what we now see is about 25 to 30 students. And this was an opportunity for low-income students to get a high-quality education, and he founded the Order of the Christian Brothers. If you asked me who is the best teacher and the best school leader 
in the city of New York. I would say it's one of these Christian brothers, a gentleman named Brother Brian Cardi, who's at De La Salle Academy on 97th and Amsterdam, and who has founded now three schools, the Monsignor Kelly School in the late 60s, De La Salle Academy, and the George Jackson Academy for Boys. And so what's incredibly sad to note is that the average Christian brother now is about 70 years old, and that this particular order is entirely disappearing, as are most parochial schools for low-income kids. And I raise all this um, because I want us to remember, one, that we are not the first reformers. There are people long before us. Frederick Douglass was starting a Sabbath school to teach kids to read by firelight from the Bible in the times of slavery. There are, there's a long tradition of education reformers and entrepreneurs before we came along. And I also want us to think about what's happening as something of a baton pass. Because if you look at the number of children in charter schools right now, we're essentially talking about the same number of kids who've disappeared from the parochial schools. And that Justice Sotomayor, if she were a student today, is probably likely to be at a KIPP school in the Bronx. She is likely to get the character lessons, not from the nuns, but from David Levin and the ideas uh, of character that are expressed in Paul Tuff's recent book. She certainly wouldn't be um, slapped in school. And so much as we think about the tough discipline that we see in charter schools, they're actually incredibly warm and friendly compared to what she experienced. She would have a very um, warm community, and one that is probably more focused on academic learning and instruction and more rigorous than what she got at Blessed Sacrament. And there would be an equity about her ability to get in or not to get into the school as a result of a lottery as opposed to a particular enterprising parent. And there would be transparency about what was happening in the school in terms of the results and the outcome and the Sunshine Law. And in fact, what's happening here with the charter sector is not the fear that many had for it, that it was shepherding an age of privatization, but rather it is the public sector roaring back and creating a new set of schools that are a new kind of public schools to increase the equity and the opportunity for low-income students. That would be my first letter to um, one of my former students. The second letter would be something like this. You asked me to tell you a little bit about my own journey. I really don't want to focus on that, but um, you heard that I worked at this place called the Robin Hood Foundation. And perhaps I should tell you how I got interested in education reform. I visited, this was 1989, about five years after college. I visited every single soup kitchen in the city of New York. I visited every homeless shelter. I visited all the programs for people with AIDS, um, and I came to believe that we have a duty to provide the, um, the very um, necessities to help people to survive. But the more I saw low-income children, the more I realized that education is the only possible up escalator for them outside of poverty, the kind of up escalator that Justice Sotomayor's family found for her. At the time, again, this is the late, uh, the late 80s, early 90s, the vast majority of philanthropy was interested in youth development. And um, this constituted essentially after-school programs, teen pregnancy prevention programs, gang prevention programs. 
and putting aside the issue that the funding streams were all um, sort of atomized, what concerned me the most is that these programs, at their very best, were trying to mop up for all of the failure that was happening in schools during the day. And it seemed like it was ineffective and inefficient. And so I would find these low tuition private schools, like Blessed Sacrament, schools in Harlem and Bedford-Stuyvesant and Brownsville, and I would come back and I would narrate to my colleagues that I had found places that truly cared, that built living communities that were going to help kids to succeed and go on to college. And my colleagues said to me, are you joking? These are not scalable. They are not serving the poorest of the poor. These are incredibly expensive and barely a blip on the radar. We should be figuring out a way to support public education in New York City. We should be supporting the New York City public schools. So I went and I visited as many classrooms as anybody around. And I, what I found was incredibly dispiriting. I found adults, at best, standing in front of students and talking without any particular learning going on, and at worst, absolute bedlam. And so I would come back and say, the way the schools are constituted right now, this is like throwing money down a sinkhole. And if you want, um, if you want to know an example of philanthropy that was wasted uh, on public education this way, go look, go look up Walter Annenberg, who basically took $500 million and threw it out the window on such projects. Um, so, um, and yet I was really struck by the nonprofits all over the city that were almost like, in the best sense, Tocquevillian. They were people who had come together to try to figure out solutions. And I would visit people like uh, Jeffrey Canada, who at the time was running an organization called the Reedland Center for Children and Families. This is before he renamed it Harlem Children's Zone. And I um, learned a little bit about what it would take to innovate and to create change. And so I started walking around telling people, I'm going to go start a school. And I moved with my family from Brooklyn, where we were living, um, to Montclair, New Jersey, because I was told that they had good, diverse schools for my own kids. And um, Lo and behold, New Jersey passed, this was uh, 1996, a charter school law. And it seemed like a whopping invitation to people like me to make the magic of the small mission-driven private schools come to life in the public sector. And so I raised my hand, I found partners, I found teammates, best job I ever had, started a school. It was a middle school, still close with the 72 kids who walked through the door on the first day. They're now 26 years old. And I'm talking, to, I'm talking to them right now. And I, um, and I um, essentially um, found my way there. And the parents said, what happens after the kids finish middle school? So we started a high school. And then people made a list of the 100 best schools serving low-income kids across the country, non-selective schools, and said, those of you who have schools like this, could you please be fruitful and multiply, make more schools. They said we should become a charter school management organization. I had no idea what that was. So we created Uncommon Schools, a play on Horace Mann's idea of the common school. Common is good, but the way in which the schools had played out, they had gotten uh, common in the worst sense. So we created Uncommon Schools to be uncommonly great. And um, now the network is roughly 32 schools, 8,000 students. It'll be 10,000 students this next fall. And there's a recent Credo report that raised questions about the charter sector broadly, but said that Uncommon Schools is reversing the achievement gap. And not only are we doing it with um, the state tests, which are pretty low level, but now this year, I'm seeing that the SAT scores and the AP scores are starting to get reversed in terms of the achievement gap. And so I was sitting around one day having beer with a guy named David Levin, who founded KIPP. And um, we were talking about how can we grow more faster 
and realize the limitations of the, of the work that we were doing? And how could we respond to people who want to do the kinds of things in regular district public schools that we were doing in the charter public schools? And so we decided to start Teacher U, which became Relay Graduate School of Education. We call it Relay because if you take an average student, 50th percentile, and you give that student four A-plus teachers, a relay of four great teachers in a row, that student's going off to college. And sadly, as happens in many low-income communities, you give that student four bottom decile teachers in a row, and you can kiss college goodbye. So we decided we were going to create an innovative program, and we were going to train teachers in the practices that worked in our schools, and now Relay is an accredited institution chartered by the state of New York. We've got 600 teachers working on their master's degrees in New York. We started an alternative certification in New Jersey. Things are going pretty well. That's my second letter. My third letter, third thing I wanted to say is, I'll be brief. Um, I do not want to overstate, I do not want to hype the success of education reform over the last 20 years. Um, I think, for the record, we're on the 20-yard line, our own 20-yard line. We have 80 yards to go to create a truly just society where low-income students can achieve at the highest level and have the same opportunities as the more affluent peers. But modestly, I do think it's fair to say that organizations, particularly Teach for America, over the course of the past 20, 22 years, have created an incredible pipeline of talent in the sector, which is to say that if you knocked on the door at 110 Livingston Street, before Teach for America, that's the bureaucracy that used to house the New York City Department of Education, and tried to figure out how can I make a difference in public education. If you were a smart, talented person from an institution like this, you'd have a hard time getting in the door. And now, there are 60,000 people who are in these top-tier universities trying to get into education reform. If you look at the people who are running districts in Washington, D.C., and Newark, and Louisiana, and Tennessee, and down the road in Lawrence, they're all people who've come through Teach for America, and they're giving their all to reform. There is more choice and safe schools for low-income parents, no doubt about it. There are some wonderful proof points. Um, I would submit to you that Uncommon Schools is one. There are probably about 100,000 kids in about 400 promising high-performing schools around the country. 100,000 students out of about 20 million low-income students out of 50 million kids across the country. But proof points. Nobody can say that low-income students cannot achieve at the highest level when given an opportunity. There are some scaling organizations. What's interesting is the Credo Report, the New York Times said, Organizations like KIPP and Uncommon Schools can scale. They're like little districts. I think Uncommon Schools now is bigger than 92% of the districts around the country. It's interesting. Education reform has created new taxonomies and systems that are being used in district schools and independent schools and parochial schools around the country. You've probably seen Teach Like a Champion. You've probably seen Leverage Leadership. These are artifacts that come out of the work that we've been doing um, in, the, in the education reform sector. There is definitely an increase of accountability. It used to be that there was just broad nonsense happening in so many schools serving low-income kids, where kids were just making a little uh, uh, temple of uh, sugar cubes. And now, with the changes in assessments, with the changes of accountability, people know the sins that are taking place at schools across the country. Um, and it appears that higher standards are on the way, that we are about to raise the bar with the Common Core, and that this is an accomplishment. Um, it hopefully will be an accomplishment. Um, but I really want to say to you that um, the baton is being passed to the new generation that has to figure out 
the next stage of reform to get us the other 80 yards down the field. Um, I'm thinking particularly of college students who are trying to uh, decide what to do after college. And I want you to bring the same rigor that you're bringing to your studies to the field of education. I've probably visited 10,000 classrooms over the last 20 years. Go and learn. Don't just talk about education, but go to the cities and suburbs and rural areas and walk in the door of schools and classrooms and try to figure out the patterns of what's wrong and try to find the great teachers who are making magic happen and what the great systems are and bring that to your work. And if you decide to go into teaching, fantastic. And if you decide to do something else with an education, you will find no better field in which to work. But now I've got 20 items for you and your colleagues to bring forward to bring education reform to the next level. One, please take the modest reforms that we've seen so far to scale. Please, it's 100,000 kids out of 2 million in charter schools who are doing really well. We've got to unlock the opportunities for more kids. Two, do not underestimate the power of poverty to oppress kids. Do not underestimate um, the imperviousness of schools and poor communities to reform. At the same time, do not be sidelined by or paralyzed by the idea that poverty trumps all. Clearly, if we have a vision of what we can accomplish and a heart and commitment to doing more, we can do so. Three, reform education not just for poor children, but reform education for all children. I don't know if um, Rick Hess has it totally right that we should throw the word achievement gap out the window, but you can imagine that if you're an average white kid and a white family somewhere in the country, the achievement gap doesn't really appeal to you. And the problem with whether it's waiting for Superman or the discourse that we've seen around education reform is it feels like it's something that is only about changing education for low-income kids. And the truth is that the education that our kids are getting in average schools is also pretty bad. 80% of Americans rate their own schools as an A or a B, but 80% of Americans think other people's school are C, D, and F. Something's not right. We need to wake up not just the parents of low-income kids, but all parents. Four, let's create a new early teacher talent pipeline and on-ramps into the profession. There is the old model of people doing student teaching. 100 years hasn't really worked. There is a new model of teacher residencies, incredibly expensive and hard to scale. 40% of kids at some point say that they're interested in going into teaching, but only 10% do. And that's not just education majors. Can we please start to talk to people who are majoring in math and science and the liberal arts at an early stage and expose them to the opportunities and potential for them to make a difference in education? Could we please figure out what a first year of teaching would look like that is not so onerous so that maybe they're teaching half time or quarter time? There are um, programs, the Match Corps here in Boston, there's a 
group called Blue Engine in New York um, that are doing some of this innovative work. You know, Teach for America and the American Federation of Teachers have the same letters and they're just in different combination, TFA, AFT. Like, let's get the AFT to start a new pipeline of teachers. Five, relatedly, figure out what it would take to create a GI Bill for teachers. GI Bill, like people think is an article of faith that that was a piece of legislation at the end of World War II that basically created the middle class and the land of opportunity in this country, right? Let's tell people who go into teaching that if they go into teaching and stay, I don't know, say five years, that's about how much time it takes to really get good, that we will forgive their incredibly expensive undergraduate debt. Let's try to create something like that. Six, and this is related also. Again, I'm speaking to 22, 23, 24 year olds. Your generation has the attention span of a strobe light. I know that you will go through many different phases of your career, but please consider teaching not just for two years, double it. Teach for four years. The mode right now, the most frequent number of years of experience of teachers in this country is one. Half of the people will leave teaching within the first five years. And you know what? I fear that the people who are leaving are the ones we want to stay, and the people who are staying are the ones we want to leave. Please consider not investing your entire life like the nun who taught Justice Sotomayor, not in your entire life living in poverty or living without possessions like Brother Brian Cardi at De La Salle Academy, but like how about four or five years? Consider that. Seven, if you go and teach, um, I got this. This is a sort of a variation on something that a famous uh, rabbi, Menachem Mendel of Kotsk, did. Um, he would have um, two uh, pieces of paper, one in each pocket, and one said, I am the dust of the earth, and the left and the right, it would say, the whole world was created for me. You don't have to put those notes in your pocket, but how about this? And your left. I am here as a servant to learn. I am humble. And on the right pocket, I can change the world. I make the weather. Eight, we've got schools across the country where principals are building managers. Please create systems and opportunities for principals to be the instructional leaders of the school, where we speed up the observation feedback loop. This is what we need. Nine, district leaders should be entrepreneurs too, right? Anybody read Osborne and Gabler back in the 80s? They said like governments should steer more and row less. Be creative in running your districts. Be a true leader who brings lots of resources to the district. We need the best people to go and lead urban districts and to be incredibly innovative and reform oriented. 10, we could spend a lot of time on this, we won't. Curricular reform. We hear a lot about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Where's the engineering? My kid went off to college, and he didn't know what engineering was until he got to college, and then he majored in engineering. Could we please have in our curriculum something that's relevant for 2013, where they're learning a little bit about the engineering way of thinking, and where everybody is learning how to code, how to code computers in high school? I think there's 25,000 kids who are taking the AP exam in computer science. How about if like three million plus ninth graders took coding as a matter of course? Go to uh, 
www.codehs.com. My, uh, uh, the TAs who ran the uh, computer science course at Stanford think that they can teach people how to code online, and they want this thing to go into schools. We need creative thinking like that around engineering. 11, rethink the grammar of schooling. This is the Tayak and Cuban phrase. They, sort of, they wrote a book called Tinkering Toward Utopia. Why is it? that people keep talking about education reform, but nothing ever happens because the grammar of schooling is stiff and schools don't really change and it's really hard to change them. And here is your invitation to think about radical redesign. Twelve, how about redesigning the buildings? We have got something like 6.5 billion square feet of facilities around the country, and they're built, I think the average one was built in the Eisenhower administration, on a factory model, right? Walls shutting kids in, doors shutting kids in. Like, look at the workplace now. Look at how people collaborate. Look at how space has changed. Let's think about redesigning the buildings. Okay, we go to school, all of us, for about 13 years, 15,000 plus hours, about, about um, 10, 20% of that sticks with kids, right? We've got to think about the value of that particular time. Every year, um, uh, on the Jewish high holiday, when I have to atone for my sins, there's something in the prayer book that says, uh, forgive me for the sin that I've committed against uh, you in the name of murder. I didn't murder anybody. But when we waste years of hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands and millions of kids' lives, it is as if we're committing murder. We are the adults. We have a responsibility to make sure that every single second that our kids spend in our care is precious. 14, online learning. We could spend a lot of time on this too. Um, there is a group called the Education Superhighway that's just trying to fix the plumbing. In other words, over the next five years, if we do this right, we can take the funding from the Schools and Libraries Corporation, which basically comes from taxes that we all pay on our phone bills, to ensure that every school in the country has high speed access to the internet. Um, secondly, go around and look over kids' shoulders at the content of what they're learning online in schools around the country. It's crap. It's really bad. But that shouldn't make us um, Luddites who think that the computer is our enemy, it should encourage us, it should encourage you to go out and create new online learning and lessons to make education better. 15, flip your classroom, right? Flip your classroom and figure out a way to do it differently. Um, 16, let's reform higher education, like doctor heal thyself, right? The higher ed field um, is going through huge traumatic change. Why is it four years? Why is it not three years? Why does it cost so freaking much? Why is it really, um, why is it really not specifically about uh, learning in classrooms? What do people remember from college anyway? What can we do differently um, to make college more relevant, more effective. 17, commit revolution against textbooks. I'm not against for-profits. I'm really not. Most of the work that I've done, nonprofit. Um, for-profit charter schools never really worked. Never really worked. I don't think they made a lot of money and I don't think they created any particular effective reform. For-profit textbooks, they're making people a freaking fortune. If you want to go make a lot of money, 
learn how to golf, learn how to sell, go work for a textbook company and convince those boards of education to buy the same five pound textbooks that we've been shoving down kids' uh, backpacks for all these years. Um, this goes for higher education too. Right now, you all and your colleagues, you are killing 5,000 trees this year just with Harvard's textbooks, right? We know that kids will not be reading textbooks, so let's think about how the lessons are modular and how they're going to look online and how we can change this. 18, radically differentiate. Radically differentiate. Think about those 15 hours, so 13 years. Do kids really need to go to school in lockstep? Why can't we meet students' needs where they are, make it standards-based, use the technology in a new way? There is a lot to this. Um, but it is time to think about how to serve individual students. It is time to think about really opening up the way we educate kids away from the factory model. 19, if we're going to go do that, consider the purpose of school. Is it educational or is it social? Do we even really remember 90% of what we learned in classrooms? Let's be honest with ourselves and our children. Many of us remember the friends we made, what it smelled like in the cafeteria, the bully. We remember prom or sports or extracurricular activities. Are we going to school for 13 years and 15,000 hours in order to be part of a social cultural experience? Or does it matter what it is that we're actually learning? I don't have a clear answer to that question. I know that uncommon schools and other high performing charter schools will continue to operate high performing schools using the old model. But please, while we're doing that, can somebody think about some new models that we could be using for all kids? 20 um, is the last one. If we do all of these other things that I just described, we radically differentiate, we change the pacing of education, and kids are on computers a lot, education entrepreneurs and reformers have got to start thinking about a cohesive American cultural experience. We are all in our socio-cultural silos. Poor kids, wealthy kids, black kids, Latino kids, white kids, Asian kids. How can we create an American experience? What is the responsibility of school to create experiences, not just in the classroom, but so that people from all different walks of life can get together? And so that people, when they grow up, are truly American and not just products of their particular neighborhood. That's worthy of education entrepreneurship, too. And so this is my last, um, my last thought. Um, again, I'm speaking in particular to former students who are trying to figure out what to do and what makes sense. I would um, urge you to think about your mission. Be authentic, it's gotta be your mission. Mine, what animates me, what I'm thinking about in relation to this work is uh, from Deuteronomy, uh, from the, uh, what I call the Torah. Justice, justice you shall pursue. So, the f why two justices? Like, why two justices? The first justice is, things should be fair. The laws should be right. Everybody should get a fair shake. That's justice. But a second justice because that's not enough. When we look at the outcomes that we see, when we look at the discrimination and we look at how people end up um, year after year, generation after generation in poverty, in poor performing schools, what can we do proactively to find a just solution for those children? 
So the second justice is essentially urging us forward to create opportunities for all children. But what interests me, some people call this social justice, right? Legal justice, social justice. But what interests me is the you shall pursue. We are enjoined, all of us, to go out and pursue, to chase, not willy-nilly for this justice, but with all of our resources, all of our cleverness, I would submit that the pursuit of social justice is done best by social entrepreneurs. So I would urge you in this next generation to be a social entrepreneur fighting for social justice, for change in education. And I look forward to hearing all the great things that you're going to go and do. Thank you very much. We've got time for questions. Yes, I think you want to go to the microphone, sir. Last week, the, there was a conference here at Harvard MIT <clears throat> about uh, education uh, learning online. They were talking about the, the program which was created at Harvard MIT called uh, edX. And they were quoting some professor who created a course at uh, Stanford. And uh, he has 15,000 students taking that course. Let me bring the other side of that. In the New York Times, there was a, <clears throat> another observation. Students who take courses online only, they, their dropout rate was 40% higher than the students who take courses online with the class, actual classrooms. The future of online learning is a kind of in a mix. I think it's a very confusing picture right now. What's the question? What, what is your, what is your uh, 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 take on it? I think with respect to online education, we're not even on the one yard line. We're in the, our own end zone. Uh, um, and we're in danger of a safety. So um, I think we've got we've to gotta move uh, forward. What, um, what is out there is um, promising and interesting, but needs a lot of development. I think it's interesting how to look at how people learn in uh, live classrooms and how people learn online. And I think one of the classic mistakes that we have with respect to online so far is that just because you videotape me giving this particular presentation and stick it online, people are going to walk away from this after like five minutes. So what is the way in which you package the online material so that people will be more engaged? Um, that, is, that, is, that is one. Two is, we haven't really figured out the assessment for what's happening online. People are motivated by somebody telling them that they're doing a good job and that they know that the person is going to give them feedback. I think online education has a lot of difficulty with that. Um, but I have every faith that edX and Coursera and Udacity in higher education and all sorts of online programs in K-12 We'll start to gnaw at this problem. And as more of you and others get involved, we will start to see uh, great things happening. Uh, how much do you feel the um, teacher attrition rate has to do with great leadership in our schools, both in affluent and low-income communities? Um, teacher attrition. Um, I think is related to um, one sort of this generational issue that I raised before. Two is the job in so many places is so incredibly hard. People want to do what they feel that they can do well. Um, and when they're not doing a good job, they feel awful. And so it's easier for them in some ways to get, get, get out of that. I think teaching can be, when all the doors are closed, an incredibly lonely profession. Um, and I think that until we create pathways for people to do different things within schools and for teachers to have different tasks, it ends up being um, less intellectually stimulating than it might be in other fields. So for example, one of the opportunities 
in online education is for teachers to start to produce content, for teachers to be involved in creating curriculum, for some teachers to be doing large group instruction, creating um, lessons, create more opportunities for teachers to be working together, for teachers to get expertise in particular areas. Um, so I'm interested in seeing how we can um, increase the teacher retention and decrease the attrition, but I think it's a really, it's a really challenging problem. The debate seems to have moved from, um, it used to be that people, people know that their teacher is teaching for 25 years, a whole career. Um, I think now people are talking about should people be teaching for three to five years, five to seven years. If you ask the head of the teachers union, she'd probably say, um, she'd probably say, I want at least 10 years. So now we're in the ballpark. What's the right? What's the right thing? The, um, there's a lot more to be done there. Hi, Norman. Uh, this uh, is live streaming across the country. So there's a couple of questions coming in from Twitter. This is from uh, Apatabi, an education junkie. Asks Norman Atkins: Is there anyone starting to rethink the quote-unquote purpose of education in a promising way right now? Um, is there anyone rethinking education purpose in a promising way? Um, I fear not. Um, I fear not. Um, and that's why I raised it as a particular issue. Um, I think we're all looking very narrowly at fairly um, utilitarian um, aims and objectives, and that um, we have not um, sort of broadly um, looked at this particular issue. What it would take would be people, for people to stop blaming the tests or the new um, uh, common core as being the be all and end all of uh, educational objectives. It is um, a, a good place to, from which to build a platform but what's interesting is what else fills the school in terms of building character, in terms of the humanities, in terms of the arts, in terms of thinking about the design of the school along the lines that I've described, in terms of thinking about what would um, service look like in a radical way. Um, I think we have a lot of work to do on that. Hi. So um, help me wrestle with something, please. Um, you touched on this a little bit when in one of your 20 points that schooling in general needs to be rethought and reformed. Um, students at an uncommon school experience a different kind of education and school day than their privileged counterparts in terms of things being highly structured, highly regimented, a longer day, um, varying access to arts, PE, right? How does that, I mean, the implication of that to me, and this is what I struggle with, is that urban, low income, typically students of color need to be educated in a different way than their privileged counterparts in order to be successful. How does that, I mean, I don't, I don't know you, but I'm curious, like, how does that sit with you? So I disagree with the premise of the question. Okay. Um, so I would say, first of all, I raised three children in the Montclair Public Schools, about five miles down the road from North Star Academy, the schools I founded, and the quality of teaching and the experience at North Star was far superior to the education that my kids got down the road, and it would have been an honor for me to have had my kids if they could have gotten in the lottery into North Star Academy. Um, secondly, I think if you visit our schools, if you really spend time visiting our schools, there is tremendous joy, and there's a tremendous attention to closing not just the achievement gap, but the opportunity gap. That is to say that the kids put on musicals, they make art, they play, they're on sports teams, um, and, that the, uh, and that the opportunities are far greater than the way you've characterized it. I think kids, um, not just in urban environments, but in all schools, are oftentimes frightened and uncomfortable in school, and that an orderly environment makes p kids feel safe and productive, and that their use of time is uh, way better. And, um, and so I, I don't particularly um, see a, a, 
a problem with what it is you describe. I think what I was raising is that um, essentially what we are doing is not different from what's happening in suburban schools or what's happening in education broadly, but we're just doing a better job of delivering a fairly standard education in this particular case, case to low-income kids. And what I'm inviting you and others to do is to consider what would be alternative models, not just for low-income kids or suburban kids, but for everybody. Okay. Uh, yes, you talked some about the, your desire for talented and motivated individuals like ourselves to go into education as teachers and school leaders. And I'm curious, um, as you think about scaling that 100,000 currently served uh, in high-performing schools to 4 million to cover all low-income kids or even beyond that, 50 million kids in general, um, the, whether there is, and I'm, I guess I'm positing that there is the need to uh, go beyond a TFA-esque model that's perhaps taking from the quote-unquote best universities and still getting a lot of quality individuals uh, in a much broader scope and whether or not an uncommon schools like model needs to change um, without people who are slightly less gung-ho or slightly less talented or if the if that model really just uh, I guess whether or how it needs to morph um, given that long-term horizon and yeah. desire for growth. Yeah, I think we need to do both. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's particularly uncommon schools. I wouldn't, I, I, I don't know that this is a problem for uncommon schools. Uncommon schools will be 10,000 students this fall. It's doing a great job. It'll be 20,000 students in a few years. That's fine. We'll keep doing a decent job. The question is what are all the other things that we need to go and do? And so I would love to see a pipeline that tries to get some of the most talented, um, kids in college and a new pipeline, but I would also love to see um, somebody target and train and develop people who are not top decile, but maybe the second decile or the third decile, but who may have more grit and determination to keep the job in an education setting for a longer period of time. I'm not sure who to bet on as the long-term uh, teacher pool, but I think that we need to, we need to, see, we need to see all of it and um, there's 165,000 teachers coming to the profession. We've got our work cut out for us. Um, so I wanted to ask a bit about the kind of funding side of, I think a lot of the things you've mentioned, you know, people, people are thinking about, um, but there's this big problem of, of sort of, you know, essentially we've, we're thinking about purposes, but we're kind of adding purposes or things for education to do or, or creating bigger challenges that it has to meet. And whether it's stuff like edX or, you know, many of the kind of solutions we come up with, they just cost more because they're trying to do something that we didn't do before and no one is giving anybody any more money to do it. You know, no one's giving Harvard money to do edX and as a result, you know, it, it's, it, it has... It's a, Harvard it's has a, a paucity of money? <laughs> it's a challenge to fund it. Um, so, you know, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of graduates with cameras trying to, trying to do stuff in their spare time. Um, so I wanted to ask you know, whether you had ideas about, you know, what are the things that either we can stop funding to, to do some of these other things that we're trying to do, or, and I don't mean, I'm not talking specifically about edX here, or what are the ways in which, um, you know, we can fundamentally kind of change how we think about education in order to, to be creating some more of these? Um, I, it's hard for me to process the sort of the Funding for Harvard is the is the big challenge. No, I mean, it's, it's um, put that to but, one side. But, but I guess I guess what's, in, what's interesting, I, what's interesting to me, is that all of the interesting innovation that's happening in technology and K twelve education seems to be happening in California, where there's far less money. The spending per pupil in California is half of the spending in so New York. a lot of that's supplemented by, uh, by venture philanthropy. Um, is this a sustainable model, I suppose, is my main question, is where are we gonna find the sustainable ways of doing education in a whole new way? Yeah. Because at the moment, a lot of it's being propped up by, by philanthropy. Yeah, um, I think that philanthropy is greasing the skids, but my, um, but my sense is that, um, that innovation has the possibility of not only being radically scalable, if we can figure out how to get out of our own end zone and onto the field, the quality of 
uh, with quality online education. It is the opportunity to change the way we educate people, not just in California or New York, but across the entire globe. I was struck that there are 20 million people watching uh, Professor Sandel's course in China. Um, secondly, um, there is the opportunity to make education financially sustainable with, uh, with that kind of technology. And I suspect that there is a lot of investment in it, not only for philanthropic purposes, but because people believe that there is going to be a return on investment. And so I don't exactly know what the future portends, but it is fantastic that Harvard and edX and Coursera and all of these other organizations are working hard to try to gnaw at this problem and figure out what the future holds. Hi there. Uh, you mentioned earlier that Uncommon Schools is, uh, right now as a CMO, larger than 92% of the districts out there. And I'd venture to guess that part of the success has been that you guys don't have to fight with one another for the same candidates in the same hiring pool. Um, and so given that sort of human capital constraint, what are your thoughts on actually getting schools to work well within the same district, same hiring pool? Um, and then a second follow-up question also about human capital is just what are your thoughts on programs like Math for America that are bringing people in for a slightly longer period of time and, and trying to get them to do an actual career shift? So Math for America would represent an example of the kind of new pipeline that I was describing. My question about it is it's just like how big is it? I, last mm -hmm. I checked, it was relatively Six small. Cities, and so the question is what would it take to build a bigger pipeline of programs like Math for America? Um, it's interesting. I was just in Memphis the other day where um, a guy named Chris Barbic is the superintendent of the Tennessee Achievement District. Mm -hmm and visited a couple of schools, and my sense is in this district, is the bottom 5% performing schools in Tennessee, and my sense is that um, he used to run uh, Yes uh, College Prep, one of the high performing charter organizations in Texas, and my sense is that he's bringing some of the same uh, human capital systems to the work that they're doing uh, in Tennessee, mm -hmm. and that people will figure out how to work well and cooperatively with each other, not only to sort through the various candidates, but also to build pipelines of folks for those particular um, schools. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering, you mentioned in your talk uh, about reforming education for everybody, not just uh, urban school students. Uh, given that philosophy, uh, should grad schools be open to not just public school, people interested in public schools and charter schools, but private schools to get that diversity of thought, to get that perspective. At this point, all grad schools are only open to people interested in public school education. So given that we're trying to reform education for everybody, uh, what is your philosophy of opening up grad schools to programs to everybody in those different programs? Yeah, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. I would say, I would imagine that if you are teaching or working in a parochial school or a private school, that you can come to uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education. You certainly can come to Columbia Teachers College and the vast majority of other programs around the United States. But is Relay, is Relay opening up uh, teach, is Relay opening up school, uh, if teachers from in private school want to come yeah. to Relay, so Relay to improve their practice? So Relay is in their second year, and my hope and dream is that in five to 10 years, when we're um, growing and further along, that we will be um, having an admissions process that brings in people from all sorts of diverse types of schools and that people would be able to come from suburban schools and rural schools and uh, parochial schools and independent schools if they want to. Hi, I heard you talk a lot about um, down the road in the future what we should do and we should reform higher ed and we should reform the teacher pipeline and I'm standing here as someone who is recruiting math teachers and I'm having a heck of a time and I came up here from New York. I graduated from Harvard Ed School last year and I have to say it's been very frustrating for me as an alum of this institution to find good math teachers who are not first year teachers. Um, I support some, some teachers who are in Relay now and they're great and they're first and second year teachers. But looking today, with what we have now, where can I as a school leader look for talented math and science teachers to build a STEM department? So, uh, question, you're talking about high school, middle, middle school? Middle school. Okay. So, um, 
I don't have an easy answer, but I would venture a couple points. One, Harvard Graduate School of Education is not the place to look for math teachers. Harvard is preparing 75 teachers. It's a tiny program. Two, um, the certification rules are pretty messed up, which is to say that in order to teach middle school math, you need to have majored in math. That is to say, in order to teach eighth grade math, even freshman algebra taught in the eighth grade, you need to have majored in math. Um, this is not smart, which is to say that given the teacher shortage, you and probably a lot of other people would rather hire people who are really gonna be good teachers and who um, can teach math but haven't spent um, their college careers studying math. Um, so I think we need to see same thing, same, same thing with middle school science. We've got to change the certification rules because there's going to be this shortage for a long period of time. Um, I think what I was suggesting earlier is I want to get, I, I, I'm positing that the next generation of reformers um, will start to identify people um, as freshmen and sophomores, philosophy majors, math majors, English majors, and start to bring these people into the kinds of schools that you're working with, such that there is a new on-ramp into the profession. In terms of going out and finding people who have been teaching for a long time and who are highly proficient math teachers and getting them to go to your school, I think you've just named a giant problem that we don't have an easy solution for. And so I'm saying go upstream and figure out how to do something different. Thank you. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about sort of the governance structure of schools and would love to hear your take on whether what has been successful in the highly success performing charter schools, those 100,000 or so kids, what's, are there structural things in the charter sector that are different from the public districts that prevent those event, those proof points in terms of gov in terms of governance whether it's got what is it is there anything that would keep what's been successful in for those hundred thousand students from happening in a district system or do we need to get to replicate those hundred thousand to scale those hundred thousand do we need to stay in the charter system um, do you understand what I'm saying yes I think I understand what you're saying um, is the long serve is the end game here a charter country or do we keep it public dis or so charter schools are public schools. I, I no, think I understand. I didn't say they weren't charter, but I public district. Yeah. Dis I'm doing yep. the district versus the, yep. the charter. Yeah, I think I understand your question. So the first thing I'd say, the short answer to your question is no. There is no reason, there's absolutely no reason why any district in the country couldn't do the kinds of things that we're doing in high-performing charter networks. Um, two, um, I didn't really talk about this, but um, if you really want to see adults act like kindergartners, go to Board of Education meetings across the United States. The governance of our schools are so embarrassing, I fear kids uh, turning on the public access channel and watching what's happening. Um, because it feels so often that it's not about driving student learning and closing the opportunity gap, it's really about uh, very parochial agendas. Um, and I wonder the extent to which um, governance gets in the way. I'm a fan of mayoral control. I'm a fan of accountability. It worries me that only like 8% of people vote in some of these school board elections and that um, uh, the, 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 the wrong people are stepping forward and, um, and, and fighting with each other. Um, so so, um, so, so you would see it as a government, the school boards would be a... I would say um, we need school governance reform. There's 620 districts in New Jersey. It's the same size as the New York City public schools where there's one district. It seems wildly inefficient at the first level, and I worry that the governance is awfully, uh, is awfully messy. Um, so, um, but if you had a well-ordered school district um, 
where a superintendent is making the soup and the board is tasting the soup, where there's healthy governance. There is no reason why that district couldn't allocate its resources and approach things in the way that uh, a good charter management organization is. Hi, Norm. Um, Rana Kiley. Uh, I'd like to ask you if you have any examples <clears throat> of uh, district schools learning from charter schools in any organized fashion. There seems to be so much animosity between the two models that um, charter schools were, were supposed to be research for how to learn. Are any district schools taking up the opportunity to learn? Do you, do you know anything about that? Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, yes, charter schools were supposed to be the research and development arm of public education. And I would say that they're working in that direction, that that is one of the, one of the accomplishments I would probably add to what I shared earlier. Um, I, an example would be this uh, Tennessee Achievement District that I just described earlier, where the bottom 5% of schools in Tennessee are in a particular district and they're adopting uh, strategies from charter schools. I have gone around and watched um, all of these classrooms around the country utilizing um, resources, um, handbooks, manuals that we've developed inside of charter schools. This summer, Relay Graduate School of Education, which is taking a lot of the techniques and strategies that we've developed in charter schools, is gonna be training 100 school principals from around the country. I think 75% of them will be um, principals in, in sitting principals in district public schools. Um, I'm encouraged by reformers like Kevin Huffman, who um, is running the Tennessee Department of Education, or John White in Louisiana, or John King in New York, and there are you know, sort of leaders who are taking a lot of what they've learned from the charter sector. Thank you. Okay, oh, we got one more question. Thank you for modeling social entrepreneurship, right? Um, so as the relay model is attainable and scalable, what is your vision for what happens to the pathway through which 85% of our teachers become educators? What happens to all the university programs and the certification programs? How do they shift? Um, I mean, I think there's a, larger, there, there, there's a larger question about what happens to higher education broadly. Um, so there are, there are within, um, within higher education, I think there are 1,400 mm -hmm. schools, departments, divisions of education. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that they will begin to adapt in the same way that K-12 schools have adapted, which is to say um, you're already seeing it, that increasingly um, higher ed institutions will um, develop their own taxonomies based on practical techniques and strategies, that they will increasingly use video, that they will hold their uh, graduate students accountable for student learning, that they will put in front of um, graduate students top teachers and not just researchers, that they will um, start to um, embrace and adapt um, and um, some will be doing it within the existing framework of higher education and some will be sort of kicking down the door and creating new institutions of higher education. It's not just Relay, High Tech High mm -hmm. in San Diego created a new uh, school of education just down the road here in Boston. In uh, Match created the Sposado Graduate School of Education. I'm told that there's another uh, group in Boston that's interested in creating a graduate school of education. So I think higher education will start to adapt and change. In it's a kind of like way. the way charter schools are influencing district schools. We're hoping that maybe higher higher ed will be influenced by marginal schools and new new type of schools. Um, one can hope. I would say also that there are. Um, fantastic um, leaders within higher education who are already doing amazing things. So um, I would sort of camp out at the University of Michigan to hear Deborah Ball describe how we train teachers in elementary math. Um, I would go to Stanford and listen to Pam Grossman uh, teach us about how to teach teachers uh, language arts at the high school level. So um, I'm, I'm, uh, I think there's a broad spectrum of people who are working on this particular issue and um, may they all go forward and do great things and may the Harvard Graduate School of Education 
end up with a dean with a leadership that is strong as the leader who's been here for the past eight years. Um, thank you all very much. It's been fun being with you.